Okay, we're fixing to get started. Did you do the double thing? I didn't know what it was. It didn't really tell me. Does it hurt like more than one needle? No, you have one needle. Small, I guess, both. So we're going to pick up with homeostasis and feedback mechanisms and all that kind of good stuff. Get my slides out so I can be sure I tell you I'll work on the bed, right? Um, so we know homeostasis is basically um, keeping everything in balance, right? But we also know that something always is going on in our body to prevent that constant balance. Um, this morning I still didn't eat breakfast. I made my shake, but it was too hot, so I didn't want it. So I don't have that at lunch. So my, now my body's using my own natural protein to keep up. Well, there's a little protein in there. There are some carbs, so there are some nutritious values in the Nutty Buddy, but not near as many as if you'd have had the peanut butter chocolate shake I was supposed to have for breakfast. It's a, it's a Reese's peanut butter shake, but it doesn't have Reese's in it. It's got a chocolate cake, protein powder, and it's got a... Uh, our peanut butter cup, peanut powder, and then like the peanut butter powder in there, and then almond milk and ice. That's, um, what? It's really good. I just let it mix too long and it got hot, and I can't break the hot sauce. Um, so, with homeo we have to think about our body. So, this is what's happening in my body. With you have that control center that's always open and running, um, sort of like the quick check. It's always open and running. 7-Eleven, always open, always running. Sometimes it's running kind of slow. And so you have these receptors out in your body that are constantly circulating. They're sort of like the police department. Always out there. Sometimes you don't see them. And then you do something you're not supposed to, like I did this morning. I didn't eat breakfast. So the cops are pulling me over going, hey, lady, you should have eaten breakfast. And it sends a message back to the control center. That receptor sends a message back to the control center. This is okay. How can we manage this problem? She didn't eat. What are we going to do? Okay, so she didn't have any reserved food in there, so we're going to make her hungry and thirsty. So that's one of the the effectors that happens. The second thing is, is okay, we're going to give her 30 minutes. That effector is going to give about 30 minutes to see if I'm going to take care of that need to eat. If I don't do that, then it's going to go on and take the nutrition from other places in my body. If I'm needing calcium, they'll take it from my bones. If I need protein, they're going to take it from my muscle. If I need energy, um, at this point, they're going to try to take it from somewhere else, not necessarily stored fat, because it has to work really hard to do that. Now, if I don't eat till 3 o'clock this afternoon, it will start burning that fat. And we saw that response yesterday with, with Caitlin when she didn't eat anything, eat dinner, she didn't eat breakfast, she worked out, and she had that hypoglycemic effect. That's her body having to work overtime. We're going to use Caitlin as an example in a minute again. Anybody want some cranberries? Um, here in a second. So we have the receptor that notifies the control center. The control center, the receptor's out there trying to find problems. Then um, the control center is there to, to problem solve. And the effector makes things happen. So, oh, come on. No, no. Can you go back in a second? So this is um, this is the ba basically the way to look at it in a concept now. So there's a stimulation, something happens, you didn't eat breakfast, sends out a message to the receptor, the receptor says, ooh, things aren't working right. That receptor sends something to the control center, and the control center sets everything at a set point. So your body has a set point, and um, we, when we learn about different parts of the body, we'll learn like normal lab values. So your body should have normal lab values. Those lab values can include protein, albumin, calcium, potassium, sodium, um, normal hemoglobin levels, all that. So that it has a set point. That means that that's where it's supposed to be. Well, that receptor goes and tells the control center your set point's not right. And so then it just has to make a decision, and it sends something to the effector to make something happen. Same thing when you get cold. Like right now, my hands are freezing. I'm always cold in this room. And when you get cold, it, your skin has receptors on it. It determines that now it's gotten colder in here. It sends a message to the brain that says, hey, um, this potentially could change your body temperature. 
the control center then sends a message out to the body that says shiver, um, give her goosebumps, tell her that she's cold. Tell her she needs to do something about it. So that's really all that's happening in that control center. This is a very busy, same form, but it talks about different systems. I'm not going to ask you any, any real, real specific system. It's going to be more along those. You're going to have to tell me on your test. I may ask you um, which one of these is the control will be a control center. So if um, if you determine something has changed in the body, what happens next? Where where does that what happens next? Where does it go to? Where does the message go to? You're going to choose control center or. Um, a decision's been made on how to resolve an issue at a set point. What does the body do? It sends uh, something out to the sensory parts of the body. Now we're going to talk about the two different kinds of control centers. You have positive and negative feedbacks. Most of the time, our body deals with negative feedbacks. So yesterday, Caitlin had a visible negative feedback reaction. Negative feedbacks are basically when something happens in the body, and you need to do something, but it's really doing on the opposite of what you think it should do. So yesterday, Caitlin didn't eat, and she got nauseous, right? You got shaky, you got nauseous. What happened when you started eating that lar bar? But initially, you, when you were trying to chew it, you were going, your body was going, don't eat it. Don't eat it. So nor, you wouldn't think your body would do that if it's hungry and your blood sugar is low. Really, it should be letting you eat things without making you sick. But what she had gone past that normal set point and, and the normal receptor set point in response and activated this negative feedback loop. So that's, she's gone past the point where her body can maintain homeostasis without some kind of outside effect. So Caitlin needed to eat, even though her body said, if you eat one more bite, you're going to throw it up. You're going to throw it up. Don't even drink, girl. Don't drink. It was telling you that. You're going to throw up. Put anything in her mouth. So a negative feedback loop is your body's kind of doing the opposite of what it's supposed to do, what you expect it to do. That happens with blood pressure. That happens with body temperature. If your body temperature gets low enough or you're truly hypothermic, do you know that before you die, your body literally thinks it's warm and you start taking, you start sweating and want to take your clothes off? That gets so hot, go out and play in the snow in your underwear. Literally, your body will think that before you die. And it's in a euphoric effect. Um, anybody ever had their blood pressure drop real low? That's what happens when your blood pressure drops real low and you stay at that. You almost pass out. And so and when it goes all over the place, when your blood pressure is high, it affects your vision like when it's low. It makes your head feel weird. So it both makes your head feel weird. You get kind of shaky. Um, it has some similar responses to hypoglycemia too where you get nauseous, you get visual changes, you get really bad headaches. Um, so those are examples of how a negative feedback loop works um, until it can correct the set point. So Caitlin, once you got enough carbs in you, did the nausea go away? Yep. Once you got enough carbs, you got enough fluid in you, then all that goes away. And it would go back to that set point where the body goes, okay, I can function for a little while. But about two hours later, you were hungry again. I'm always hungry. But normally, if you just eat something small like that, a couple of hours later, you will be hungry again. It did have protein. It did have glucose. It had things that she needed right then. Um, and like for a diabetic, when if she had been a diabetic, the best thing she could have done was eat that Laura bar and then go get some milk to go with it. Pro when you add, I know it sounds gross, but milk along with um, a sugar, because there's more protein in milk, it will help keep that sugar from just going up and back down. Um, people will tell you, oh, if, you're, if your blood sugar is low, eat a banana. Eat a candy bar. Drink a cup. Yeah, as long as you're fixing to eat something else, that's great because it gets your blood sugar up where it needs to be. But if all you do is drink a Dr. Pepper or a Coke, would get your blood sugar up probably to around 150, but in about 45 minutes, it starts to drop again. So, same thing goes along with testing. You know that if you eat something really sweet right before you take a test, a candy bar, that nutty buddy, uh, nutty bar or whatever, right before you take a test, as long as the test is not more than 30 minutes, it actually comes again. After 30 minutes, though, if your test is like 150 questions, it's a three-hour test, you need a sandwich and something decent in your stomach. 
but initially it will actually make your brain function more efficiently that first 30 minutes when your sugar is in off the window. What about another candy bar? Um, you really need to start putting, because it's going to spike, you're still going to drop, and it's going to spike again, and it's going to drop, and that's just going to make you feel bad. But if you can, instead of drinking that, eating that candy bar, if you had, had if you had, maybe drank a Coke along with eating a bacon, egg, and cheese biscuit, those are really my favorite. Um, you got protein in there, you got protein in your egg, you got protein in your, um, the cheese, you got protein in the bacon, and that biscuit is a complex carbohydrate that it takes your body a while to, bro to break down. It, that Coke is instant sugar. It's 16, a, a can of Coke is 16 teaspoons of sugar. So that's instant utilization. So you get that and then you're, it, it kind of, it'll shoot you up and then it'll kind of keep you level and it'll, your blood sugar will decline lower, slower so that you are more productive. Are these things good for you after you work out? Um, it has, it, no, it's okay, but it's also good to have a little bit of carb, too. I thought that's that's what, pretty um, much just protein. I thought that's what... Almonds, almonds have, most. they're mostly fat and protein. Cheese is mostly fat and protein. I'm not saying it's good, I love cheese. Okay, so positive feedback loop. That means things happen in the body to accelerate activity. So anytime, um, anybody it doesn't last long. So anytime a positive feedback loop, one of them would be um, when the body forms a clot. If you're injured, say you cut your hand, uh, influx of inflammation happens so that it can stop the bleeding. Um, you get red blood cells and white blood cells and macrophages all come in there to make that clot. That's positive because it's stopping something bad from happening to your body. Um, childbirth is also considered positive. It's temporary. And once it's done, the parasite that's been living in your body is gone. Well, if you think about a baby in terms of what they're doing inside your body, that's exactly what parasite is. They do, they're, they do the same thing, except we, we like this parasite. We want to keep this one, and we want it to come out and grow and, and develop and be a wonderful human being. Did you tell yeah. your child they were parasites? Yes. I, I tell them. I, I tell them that I love them. But yes, I, I have. Probably in their lifetime, told them that you did. Yeah, because I did not have good pregnancies. My pregnancies were difficult, all three of them, and so I uh, would tell them yes. Um, there were times where I did feel like, especially my my kid, my, my girls were really big. They were almost close to nine pounds, and they were close to two foot long. Did you have so, sections? Yes. Okay. So I, you know, the last trimester, I kind of felt like I needed to walk like this because there was so much baby in there. I mean, they were huge babies. Did you have three C-sections? Huh? Did you have three C-sections? I had one C-section. My son was only a C-section because I had to have my gallbladder removed at the same time. Uh, he was the smallest of my kids. He was six weeks early and he weighed seven two. Oh, he would have been a big baby. They, the doctor told me the whole time he would be 11 or 12 pounds. Oh my God. Now he's six foot two and about three hundred pounds. Six foot two, three, and he's three hundred pounds. He's a big kid, and he's broad. He's really broad shoulder. And he has a really big head. All my kids have big heads. Yeah, they all have big. They all have big heads. At least the girls, they're like their body kind of. He's just huge. He's just a huge kid. But that's also safe to have. Um, now as many as you. What and you, years ago, you could have a C, you could, if you had one C-section, you had to have all C-sections. I'm just not built to deliver children. Um, my pelvis is not built to deliver children. Um, I labored for 38 hours with my first child. And it was all induced labor, too. So I had, for 38 hours, I had contractions every minute, every two minutes lasting a minute. Yeah, I know the contractions hurt worse than actual child, the actual child, but I don't know. I never delivered. I never delivered one. My girls will tell you that um, delivery was not that bad. But like they weren't in labor a really long time, uh, for a really long time. Elizabeth, my oldest child, when she had her baby, she went about 5 o'clock in the morning. So she's in labor about 12 total hours, maybe not quite that long. Um, she moved along real rapidly till she got to a nine. She stayed at a nine for an hour and a half, and then she delivered. She had, did not need an epidiotomy. She had no tearing. 
the baby delivery break. Um, Shelby also stayed at a larger number longer, which helped that cervix and everything kind of stretch and move as, as opposed to, most people will get to a seven and they go from a seven to ready to push within, you know, an hour or two. Yeah. Uh, I mean, just quickly. So it's good that But because they slowed down at the end, it allowed everything to kind of move naturally. So when they delivered, they didn't have a lot of trouble. Like literally, Elizabeth pushed twice, Shelby pushed three times, and nobody was working. Was it uh, no. They did have an epidural. They did have an epidural. And I'm just telling you guys, epidurals, why would you not use one? You're bad for your side back. It's not any worse than a small town. Huh? Not the way they do them now. I mean, li literally, they just numb your belly now. Like when I had an epidural years and years ago, 21 years ago, I did my last I thought it went your sciatic nerve. They go, they go up a little bit higher. They, like my epidural, my first epidural was near the side. Now they go up higher uh, because they're really just numbing your belly now. They don't numb your parts. Well, it doesn't. It, does. it, it okay. numbs your abdominal pelvic area. Oh, okay. That's okay. it. When I had my kid, they numbed you from right here down. They put a catheter in and you weren't getting out of that bed. Now the way they do epidurals, it's a slow drip the whole time. You can literally get up and walk around and push your whole around. Wait, but the needle's still in your back? No, no, it's just a catheter. It's no different than an IV. It's just a tube. Well, my mom, she was saying okay. that she got her epidural with me. She, like, it, it, um, she thought, she, like, oh, the doctor like, got it in wrong or whatever. So her sciatic nerve hurts all the time. Yeah. yeah, they do a much better job. In the last five years, they do a much better job with epidurals. Okay, so let's move on to the human body and body cavities. Most of y'all should know the body cavity. Oh, is it an epidural for the baby? That's what I'm to do. If it get, if the, if you get an excessive amount, I mean there are risks, and no matter no matter what you do, there are risks. Like if you push um, a baby out, you can break their collarbone. They can get hung in the birth canal. Cord can be around their neck. Yeah. All kind. I mean, there's all, there's risks, and no matter not just birth, but with any procedure you have done, there are risks. So like, just know your risks, and then you decide. Uh, I don't think Elizabeth will have an epidural next time because uh, it wasn't effective for her. It helped her the first few hours, and even though they adjusted the dose of the epidural, after about two hours, it didn't even touch the needle at all. So sometimes they're not effective. Sometimes they, um, like when I had Shelby, when they pulled the, the uh, needle that they use out from the catheter, it literally split the catheter, or the tubing, and so they had to pull it out and undo it. Um, I was 19, almost, almost 20 years old then. I didn't know any better. Now I know um, I would have just rather them have me have done general anesthesia. There was no way I could deliver. Um, the, both my both of the girls had the cord around their neck three times. Elizabeth, she was in the birth canal ready to deliver. And within about five minutes, her heart rate went from 160, which was normal. By the time they got me into OR to do my C-section, her heart rate was in the 40. So basically, if you remember, if any remember with CPR, once a kid gets to 60, you got to do resuscitation on them. So um, that that was another reason they did not have an. I, I grew I grew an abnormally long umbilical cords as well, so they knew that that was another reason besides my pelvis wanted to do that. Uh, my brother, whenever he was born, he immediately got sick and was in the and uh, like. Because he immediately got sick and his heart rate immediately went down. It probably because low glucose levels. Because he almost died. Yeah, probably a really low glucose level. Brooklyn was born like not dead, but she wasn't breathing and she didn't have a pulse whenever she was born. Mm -hmm. She was born nine weeks early. That's how long could have been up for her with her because of the like, actual yeah. her. Yeah, sometimes you can't. Okay, so our cat body cavities. We have a cranial cavity that houses what? Oh, your cranial mm -hmm. cavity. Your houses brain. your brain. You have a spinal cavity. That is all, or your ver vertebral cavity. That is also considered the dorsal cavity because it's dorsal means tail. So like a dorsal fin is on the back, right? So that is also considered your dorsal cavity on the back. You have a thoracic cavity that houses your lungs and your heart and it stops at the diaphragm. You have an abdominal cavity that houses, that houses your it's large and small intestines, your kidneys, um, and then you have your pelvic cavity that houses your bladder, your uterus, your um, ovaries. It has, we also consider that 
the testes in that area, how it houses your reproductive and your urinary organs. Um, it's also considered the abdominal pelvic cavity when we talk about both of those. Cavities are really easy. The, ha the heart itself, though, is in its own cavity. It has, um, it's in the pericard, or the, it's in the mediastinum, which is the center, media mediastinum means center, um, and it has a pericardium. It has a uh, membrane around it called the pericardium. And the membranes around large organs to keep them because you know they're constantly moving, so it keeps them from having friction issues. Um, the lungs, you have two pleural cavities that are uh, membrane that are the membranes around the lungs. That way, when you breathe in, breathe out, it's not actually sticky to anything. That would be really painful. People who have pleurisy, you guys ever heard of grandparents like I had pleurisy when I was 20, 30, or 40. That means what that means is that lubrication between those two membranes. It um, was not there like it should have been, and literally when they would breathe, the lung would stick to the outside cavity or the outside membrane. How do you fix that? Fix it? No. Um, they give them something called surfactant that we give babies. If we're a preemie is born, we give them something called surfactant. It's a steroid that makes you develop. How do you uh, give it to them before they're born? Um, mom takes it, and then and mom takes it in an IV. Give it in an IV, it gets to the baby. Hopefully, you can give it to them about 12 hours before they're born, and it helps lubricate and helps their lungs work better. Like my son was on a, on a ventilator for about a month um, so before uh, he got to come, before they extubated him and he got to come home. Uh, and we they gave him surfactant, but it wasn't it, it didn't work the way they wanted to. And it's really surfactant we'll learn in the respiratory. It's just a steroid. Okay. So your thoracic membrane, uh, or your th thoracic and abdominal uh, areas have serous membranes. So those serous membranes are what I was talking about. Those are those fluid-filled membranes. Serous membranes keep that lubrication in between there. You also have serous membranes in other places. Um, your synovial joints, which are the joints that move, they also have um, serous membra toxic membra type membranes in there. Think about it, if, you, if you move the bones and they rub each other, how painful that would be. There are a lot of people who do have, as they age, become bone on bone. So your thoracic membrane has a visceral membrane, and that is that, the membrane covering the whole outer part of the thoracic cavity. Then you have the parietal membrane. That's the one on the inside. So there's two membranes that cover that. Visceral means, uh, um, sorry, I told you that backwards. Visceral means near the organ. Visceral means near an organ. Parietal means outside. So it, you have those two membranes there. And like I said, you have that pericardium that is also two lubricated membranes. One's near the heart and one's on the outside to keep it protected from the lungs as you breathe. You don't want, when you breathe, you don't want your lungs sticking to your heart while your heart's trying to breathe. So you have those membranes there. Um, you have the Repair, uh, in, your, uh, in your abdomen, you have a, your abdomen is sterile, so all these membranes are sterile. Um, in your abdomen, you have the parietal, which is the outside um, membrane that, uh, it's called the parietal peritoneum. That the peritoneum in, um, is just this big membrane right in this area that protects, that protects uh, and keeps the uh, um, intestines from adhering to the uh, diaphragm. So when you breathe, your diaphragm can move smoothly and it's not sticking. Um, if your diaphragm can't expand enough, you can't breathe in enough. If it can't relax enough, you can't breathe out enough. So you uh, and then you have the perineum. Your perineum is the one that's in the pelvic cavity. Your perineal membranes are in the, in the pelvic cavity. Um, if anything happens, in some, like when you have any kind of abdominal surgery, uh, you might have their appendix out. Mm -hmm. So, I have a scar here, and I have one here. Um, when they open you up at any time, they say when they had done my gallbladder surgery, that looked like this. If they have been dirty when they did that, and I've got an infection in there, it's called peritonitis. Peritonitis is deadly. Um, you get, I mean, or if they nick your bowel, um, you don't want to have any type of I worked with one doctor that every time he opened the lady up to do a hysterectomy, he would nick her small, the large intestine every time. 
and then they would end up, we would end up having that in the wash. Their goat takes it back in, clean out their belly. Mm -hmm. uh, he would, he would uh, when he was budding or, uh, uh, or cauterizing, he would actually make an, a little small part of the, the bowel. So stuff would drain out into the abdomen. So we had to go in and clean that out, give them a lot of antibiotic therapy so that um, they would not be. How did a few every time a he, lost his, he lost his license oh. later? He lost his license later. So that, yeah, you do that several times and you get sued enough. So we couldn't lie when we went back in. Like I, sometimes I worked on the call, uh, the OR call, call strip and that would do circulation. Um, when you would have to take them in at 2 in the morning and lavage an abdomen, you had to, got the, you had to document what you saw, and that was not him doing that procedure, it was a general surgeon, surgeon that was doing it. So he would put, down into previous uh, procedure, this is what we did to clear it up. And then we would, look, we would actually irrigate the belly with antibodies too. This shows you then what the serous membrane looks like. So if you look, you've got this outer membrane and this inner membrane, and this is that lubrication that keeps things from sticking together. This is actually a dissection of the lung and heart, and this is your belly, the lower end of the abdomen itself. So that goes through the stomach, the pancreas, these are the kidneys, the vertebrae, and those are the bottom of the lung. So that's what that, that cross section looks like, so you can see what those serous membranes look like. Okay, so lifespan changes. What happens when we get old? Talk about some things that happen when we get old. Okay, we're cool. um, as, we like so this is our normal. This is the normal anatomical position. Anatomical position is my feet are facing forward, my palms are facing forward, my face is facing forward. That's anatomical position. When I am ten, does it look the same as it does when I am eighty? Is everything going to be in the same place? Oh, no. So as we age, things move around. Um, and we have to know what it's supposed to look like to begin with so that we can know is that a normal aging process. We have to pay attention to what normal anatomical position is and what the skin would look like, what the eyes would look like. If I had had a stroke and I was standing here and you were looking at me in this position, you might see facial drooping, eye drooping, um, even to the point some people get so bad that if they can stand, they even lean to one side or the muscles will be, will be uh, less defined on one side of the body than the other. Um, when we talk about anatomical position, we talk about where things are on the body. So these are all basically vocab terms, but what do you think, that one goes starts with superior, uh, superior. So what do you think superior means? What does the word superior mean? Good. Means like, good or above? Above. So anything superior, if I ask you, um, the, no, the nose is, or the heart is what to the nose? Inferior. It's going to be inferior. The nose would be superior because it's above the heart. The heart is below. So superior means above. Inferior means below for us. Um, anterior versus posterior. In an anatomical position, this is the anterior part of the body. So it gets kind of tricky because if I ask you, if the patient is standing in an anatomical position, are the hands anterior or posterior? The palms of the hands anterior or posterior? They're going to be anterior, but if you you have to think about all of the the whole question because normally we think about them being posterior because we normally stand like this, don't we? We would normally, would normally be facing to the side or to the back. So you have to make sure you read the question. Medial means middle. So if something means, if medial is middle, that means lateral means on the middle side. So if I ask you what is a medial lateral ligament, what would that be? It's on the, middle, you're outside. It's on the outside middle. Where, where do you have a medial lateral ligament? that gets torn all the time. Your knee. your knee. So your ACL is your medial lateral ligament. Um, it's kind of on the middle outside because it runs around the outside of the kneecap. Where is the meniscus? Is it behind the kneecap? They're behind the kneecap. Um, incipitous lateral versus contralateral. So that sort of insipidus means inside, contra would mean outside. So if I talked about, um, if I asked you the stomach, 
or no, let's have a, the gallbladder would be contralateral because it's inside. If I ask you about um, the location of normal, um, normal, a normal nipple, that would be, or areola, that would be insipidus lateral. It's going to be, should be on the side. It shouldn't be like it should not be inferior to the pelvis. It should be in the right location. Now there are times they are inferior to the lateral and inferior to the pelvis, but it doesn't have anything to do with that either. Sometimes when now, sometimes when someone has to have complete reconstruction after surgery, they'll literally remove their nipple and put it on their thigh or on their back so that it continues to stay healthy while they have um, tissue expanders in. Then they can put their own nipple back where it belongs instead of them not having it. Take it off. And... No, just, they just they scrapped it. What do you mean reconstruction? Like so if you have breast if you have breast cancer, and they have to remove all the breast tissue. They put these things called tissue expanders, which looks looks like a, a giant cork and they put in there. They're really hard and firm, but it makes uh, them able to put um, implants in and, and sew those to the chest cavity, and then they can put your nipple back on. If they don't do that, and you've had a complete reconstruction, you don't have one at all. So a lot of people who've had bilateral mastectomies with reconstruction, they don't have nipple. Now that they've learned how to let things graft and grow on your body, they can. Aren't your nipples supposed to be in line with your ears? I heard that. That it's like directly... That depends if you have a really big head or your ears are not that and not necessary. <laughs> okay, proximal versus distal. The easiest way to remember proximal and distal is distal is the same as distance. Distance means away, right? So if distal means away, proximal is going to be close to or near like near the center, near the origin. So the proximal end of my bicep is here, the, di the distal end would be near my elbow. Um, and internal and external and are, are about the same as superficial and deep. Superficial just means it's on the top, on the outside, like your skin is the most superficial organ that you have. And deep would be, anybody ever gotten hit so hard they had a bruise and didn't come up for about three or four days? That's why they call it a deep bruise because you do have a bruise, it's just under layers of muscle tissue. Like, is that like a well, what is it? It's just under? It's, it's going to be down inside. Deep will be inside, um, above, below the surface. And internal means inside and external means outside. Okay, so now we're going to talk about body planes. Um, so when we talk about the body in terms of planes, that's how we section the body off and we even use those terms in surgical procedures. Sagittal means separating left and right halves. Sagittal means separating left and right halves. Medial sagittal means exact middle of the left and right. So that would be a line that would cut from the middle of my head all the way down, mm -hmm. separating me in left and right sections. Do you measure left and right from our point of view or your own point of view? You, no. It is, so if you're facing me, my left, it's going to be on the body. Not your left or right, it's going to be an anatomical position. So that's your left. So this is my left, this is my right. If you're standing facing me, it's just the opposite. So it's the person, the patient's left and right. Okay. Um, transverse. Transverse means through the middle. So if someone has a C-section, they have what's called a low transverse incision. It's a lateral incision that runs long ways in the, across the middle and low because it's below the, the umbilicus. So, um, a true transverse plane would cut through the, the belly button. Um, can't they do them like really tiny, like that big for C-section stuff? It's about a six inch. It's about a six inches. Six inches. Six inches. Oh, I know one. It's but mine's got pelvis bones. Pelvis bones. I know somebody who's uh, C-section went down. They didn't go across the Sometimes they have to go down. Mm -hmm. And But if you have babies that are over 30 years old, most of them were up and down. Um, they, those are new techniques that they learn later on. Years. No, like if you're having a baby five years old and you have a C-section, they will have had, they may have done it uh, up and down. Sometimes if they have something called a placenta previa, where um, the placenta is the uterus is the placenta is tearing away from the uterus, they have to do a um, a medial incision because of the way because they're so, in such a rush to save the mom and the baby from bleeding to death. Um, the coronal plane separates front and back. Frontal or coronal plane separates front and back. So you will need to know those, like you will have those in images, sort of like this. Okay. Um, it also means, section. when we think about sections, you know how we talked about CT scans and MRIs? 
they do things in lateral, um, and lat medial and lateral, they do things in transverse planes, they do things in um, frontal planes, they do, they can slice the body that way. And we really utilize it besides surgery and diagnostic procedures. Um, this just shows you the different cross sections of the brain. Um, the, the top one would be a sagittal plane because that's the left and right, that's the left hemisphere of the brain. Um, the second one would be a transverse plane, so it's cut, it has removed the brain stem and um, part of the, um, it's removed part of the brain stem, the midbrain, it's just cut it in half, top and bottom. And then, so that would be a sagittal plane. And then um, the last one would be cutting it in half front to back. So the uh, cerebellum and the brainstem are at the back, and then you have your frontal lobe. So that would be your frontal or coronal plane. And that is the same way they're doing cross sections of vessels. They're cutting it um, long way. They're cutting it front, front and back of the vessel, the coronal plane. They have an oblique, uh, an oblique section. An oblique section of a vessel is when they do a diagonal cut. Oblique just means diagonal. Uh, and then they do a cross section, which is cutting it cutting it in half, a, cutting it, a section of it in half. Um, they do, depending on what vessel they remove to do a um, on bypass grafts, sometimes they have to do a cross section and sometimes they do, do a regular cross section and sometimes they have to do an oblique. It just depends on how they're removing it. Uh, how much time do we have? Okay, I'm going to do the quadrants of the abdomen real quick, and then we'll stop. So, if you are charting in the medical field, unless you're working with a gastroenterologist, you're going to chart right upper quadrant, left upper quadrant, right lower quadrant, right left lower quadrant. That's how they're going to see the entire body, it's just in that mixed quadrant. Um, gastrointestinal folks, though, they do it in eight seconds. But for the most part, they're going to ask you, is it right upper? Right upper quadrant, we have gallbladder and liver. Left upper, upper quadrant, and we have part of the pancreas. Left upper quadrant, we have pancreas, uh, and we have uh, spleen. Left lower, and then we have parts of the um, large intestine. What does the spleen do? The spleen helps um, mature B cells that are part of your immune system. Yeah. Also, it should have reserved blood in there. We have like any organs that we don't actually like have no blood Your appendix. No, your gallbladder. It works. It helps. Well, you have to have it removed. It's pa it's a, it's a pain in the behind, but your gallbladder produces bile, which helps break down fat. Like I can't eat lettuce. I can't eat it. But if I eat it, I have to go out and stay in the bathroom for a while. I like gallbladder. He was out for like six weeks. Yeah, you have to be out a while. The one had golf stones. So if we talk about uh, hypo and hyper, um, your hypogastric area are right and left, and they're in the upper, upper, very upper quadrant or upper sections of that quadrant, then you have an epigastric area. That's in the middle. Then you have, and it kind of goes along with the, the abdomen. Hello? Hang on, you're on speaker. Is that okay? Do you need to tell me something on speaker or do you need to pick up my phone? Do you need a van over there today? Tomorrow. Tomorrow? Yes. Okay. All right, what um, I'll just come get it in the morning. Is that okay? Yep. And then I need a bus for between second and third and third after third period. I'll put it in with times today. Right. Okay, thanks. They uh, are installing something for me today, during those class, so. Okay. So are we going to practice the CPR? Yeah, we're going to move to this side. Like the CPR. You did not show me the video that we had to watch last year. From I know, but I didn't have the video. Fun. I didn't have the, the discs that I have this year. They're bad. They were hilarious. They're just hilarious, horrible acting. They're like, we watched bad. that my freshman year. So you're, and let me tell you real quick, you're, uh, the middle section is the lumbar. So they're all referred to as lumbar, right, right lumbar, left lumbar, and umbilical region because that's where your belly button is. Your belly button is called the umbilicus. 
our umbilicus, depending on what procedure you have. And then right here you have your iliac uh, nerves and the iliac trees. Her vessels are right here, so that's right and left. And in the center is your hypo. So if this is this is hyp this is hyper or hypo. Uh, we call it hypergastric and hypogastric. But anyway, we'll go back over that little piece. Yes. So, um, I have an issue. Okay. So I work places. Work Wednesday. Like I work every Wednesday. So, um, so go back to the only 